I'm going to be speaking about the Juhuri language today. Um, let's start with talking about why I use the word Juhuri, um, because it's likely that if you've encountered the language before or will do so in the future, you may hear it referred to by different names. For example, this is the cover of a Soviet era literary almanac that came out about once per year um, from 1960 onward. And it's called, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, Vatan Sovetimu Almanach Ezuhun Tati. Um, you can see the translation, our Soviet homeland, an almanac in the Tat language. Here's that word, um, Tati. It's the last word um, on the cover in the bottom right. What does this word mean? Um, well, there's been a trajectory over the course of Russian imperial and Soviet history um, to refer to the Jewish communities that are rooted in the Eastern Caucasus mountains. So we're going to see maps in a bit, but we're talking about um, the area that's next to the Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan, Dagestan, kabardino balkaria and Chechnya for the most part. Um, one of the terms that um, outsiders to the community have used is mountain Jews or Gorskia Yevrei. So the language um, was referred to and sometimes still is in Russian as Gorska Yevreiski Yezik, the mountain Jewish language. Um, this was the case uh, in the Russian Empire. That's how Russian officials would refer to the language. And um, in the early Soviet period, uh, we see evidence of that in documents that historians are still accessing today. Um, then um, there's a historian Dushad Ramazanova who has documented the way over the course of the 1930s, the government started using this term Tatsky or Tat. Um, where did this come from? Well, um, the word Tat has been used to refer to uh, a couple of different groups, primarily to um, a Muslim community, a set of Muslim communities in the Caucasus that uses a language very similar to various Juri varieties. Um, and there's also a Christian group that uses a similar language. The Soviet government's policy by the end of the 1930s across regions, this developed in a haphazard way, but um, the end point was all of you are Tats and you've been artificially divided by religion. Um, this created a circumstance where today Juhudi is known um, by some linguists as judeo tat um, It's true that linguistically there are a lot of similarities, but there's evidence that from the early Soviet period at least, um, and even earlier, Juhur Ho or um, the Jewish people who use this language have called the language Juhuri, which actually just means Jewish, um, just as Yiddish does. So Juhur uh, means Jew, Juhuri, Jewish, Juhur Ho, Jews. Um, and when used in other languages, that tends to mean specifically this Jewish community um, from the Eastern Caucasus. Um, now, it's important to me to use this word um, and to spread the word about it because um, of the impact that it has in activism today. So um, the optional reading for today was this interview with Valeria Nakshun, my good friend and collaborator. Um, she was interviewed by George Priga for the publication Jewish Currents. And um, I'm going to be referring to the interview a number of times today. Um, Nera says, my uncle was Jewish, but um, she says that it didn't say Jewish on his passport. Um, she's referring to the fact that in the Soviet Union, people had a nationality label on their passports. So in this case, it was common to have the word tat used to label Juhur Ho, but in the case of Lera's uncle, um, the passport actually said Tata, referring to uh, a different set of predominantly Muslim groups, actually predominantly Turkic speaking. So um, you can see that the impact of Soviet policy was on one hand, state support um, for certain endeavors in the Juhuri language, but also there was a condition that the Jewishness of the language had to be absent. Um, and we're going to see that come up again and again. I think it's really important um, to underline, just for understanding language politics today on a broader level, um, when we think about how uh, the world got to a place where, uh, for example, global English is unavoidable for so many people from an early 20th century situation when you had many language communities campaigning to use their own language, envisioning a very multilingual world. Uh, it's important to recognize that both the U.S. and the USSR had these uh, policies of what uh, some scholars call uh, dominant multiculturalism, dominant multilingualism, basically uh, encouraging um, a multiplicity of language use in principle, but on certain conditions. In this case, the erasure of Jewishness. Um, so 
Why do, why do I care? Why am I involved? In addition to the motivations I've just spoken to, um, I think it's important for anyone who is working with a, a language like Juhuri that where the stakes are so high, where activism is so prevalent um, to, to give reasons, legitimate reasons for involvement in the community, particularly in cases like mine where I make my living in part by working with the Juhuri language. And I hope that this will contextualize what my presentation today can and can't do. Um, so I um, actually am from an Ashkenazi family. My parents grew up in Kibbutzim um, in Israel, Palestine. And um, I started learning Russian in uh, my undergraduate years in part because of my family's socialist past. That took me to Moscow where I was placed with a host family where my host mom and host aunt were from Dagestan. They were Juhuro. And um, that was my first point of connection. And um, in the aftermath, I was thinking about how to make the language access that I'd had useful. So growing up um, speaking modern Hebrew with my parents, learning Russian, having access to extensive education in that language, having access to English uh, because of my family's immigration history. And um, I was doing research about language activism in Juhuri, the language of my good friends, and learning that literature and literary translation played a huge role in how people advocate for the Juhuri language today. Uh, so I decided to start gauging whether it might be useful to have someone like me around, um, someone who has access to institutional resources and also extraordinary access to language through no um, you know, particular choice of my own, but through life circumstances and privileges. Um, that led me to a research path and a translation path dealing with the history of Juhuri creativity. So literature on one hand and orature, meaning um, essentially artistic words um, or verbal art that's spoken rather than uh, written down. And um, that is a term that um, I learned about from Gogi Watyongo. I think it's really useful because if you say oral literature, it's basically saying that um, what's spoken is subservient to what's written. Uh, I can also uh, speak in, in certain ways based on my, my learning to the role of language politics and colonialism. And that's something that's really affected Juhuri from multiple angles. However, there are limits to what I can speak to in this presentation, particularly because I myself not Juhuri. That means I'm not coming to this with a personal history um, or an extended family heritage and deep connections with Juhuri elders that I've drawn on my whole life. Um, and I'm also not coming to this presentation with a personal kind of impact um, that my teachers and collaborators do. So um, if for whatever reason I, I had to or um, chose to walk away from the Juhudi language, which I'm not going to do, um, that would not affect my ties with my heritage in the same way that it does my collaborators. Also, I am not a trained linguist. So my presentation is going to focus a lot on the function of the language in culture, in literature, and history, um, because I don't have the particular technical skills and tools to do some of the analysis of sociolinguistic variation and um, historical linguistics that you may have seen in other presentations. But I'm really happy to direct you to other resources on those counts. Um, on the left, you can see one of the impacts of this particular position, which is a collaborative language study group that um, Valeria and I co-organized. Um, this is one of the ways that I um, decided to use my position just to, um, during particular time periods, run language lessons. And I hope that um, if, you, if you take an interest, um, you'll uh, contact me about any further resources you're interested in. Okay, we're going to start then with um, the movement of um, Juhuri people and their ancestors over time. Um, and we're gonna start in the heart of the Persian empire in the fifth century. In this image, you can see Khosrow I, who um, constructed a wall at the Northern borders of the territories that he had conquered and controlled in a city called Derbent. And that has re been recounted in a document called the Derbent Name. Um, now Derbent, okay, so, the first important point of movement that you'll see in Juhudi history um, is again based on um, very old sources and um, documents a move to this city here on the shore of the Caspian Sea near the Caucasus Mountains. Now, the Bent was far from the only place where um, families moved from the southern points of the Persian Empire, especially Jewish families. Um, there's a history of uh, Jewish settlement. Um, further to the west, further to the south in particular, but I'm going to focus on Derbent because it has been such a long-standing cultural center. Um, 
So you have documentation by a 10th century Armenian historian of 7th century settlements. You have um, documentation of uh, Jewish communities numbering in the thousands by the 17th century when you start having European colonial officials moving into the area. Um, and most of all, you have movement into and out of cities based on conditions of safety for Jewish people in this area. So once you get into the 18th and 19th centuries, I want to focus on another location that had long um, seen Jewish life, and that is Kobe, um, in uh, northern Azerbaijan, according to contemporary national and political borders. So in the 18th and 19th century, you start having major contestation between the Persian Empire and the Russian Empire um, over territory. And at first, the Khuba Khanate um, strives for neutrality um, and even has Jews under its protection. But then um, when the Russian Empire starts making a push to to move further down and to in, further south, excuse me, and, and conquer territory, including places where Jews lived in the Eastern Caucasus, things get more dangerous. And a lot of Jewish families moved into the mountains, moved into mountain villages. Now, this is really important for the um, history of the language, the Jehudi language, because by this time, not only do you have differentiation from the Persian that's being used further south, um, so you actually have some features that are closer to Middle Persian than to the contemporary uh, Persian language of the day. You also have contact with Eastern Caucasian languages that are not Persian, that are not Turkic, um, that have a really incredible diversity of grammar and vocabulary. And that continues to um, cause exchange with the Juhudi language and, and make it really, really distinct from Persian, actually not mutually intelligible in the present day. Now, um, so this pattern over time is that you have movement um, into mountain villages, but then returning to cities, depending on circumstances of safety and economy. And um, then you have that happening in, in other 19th century Jewish communities as well. Um, and now as we're moving further north and east, um, again, this is not the movement of people, but just other locations that were important to Juhurhu at the time, uh, you have also different language varieties that are being used actively in these places. Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, is one of those places. Nalchik in kabardino balkaria is one of those places. And also Vartashen is a major center of Jewish life in the 19th century. That's also in Azerbaijan. The major shift during the 20th century is urbanization in the Soviet period. So you have Juhur Ho um, choosing to move to cities or being pushed um, to move to cities that were um, larger than the places that they'd uh, been living in before um, and which were bustling in new ways. For example, Baku became a major center for um, fossil fuel production, for oil production, just oil city. Um, and that um, really shifted the linguistic landscape as people from different parts of Azerbaijan came to a single place um, and started exchanging language among themselves. Here you see the alphabet that developed um, and, and was instituted by the Soviet government in Azerbaijan in response to um, this movement. Meanwhile, there's a city, Mahachkala, now the capital of Dagestan. Dagestan is currently under the political purview of the Russian Federation. Um, you have uh, a similar kind of gathering together of people who had formerly been in Khasavyurt, Buinaksk, Derbent, um, smaller villages like Nyugdi, other places, congregating in a single larger city. Um, there's also a forced project of settlement in the lowlands on the part of the Soviet government. So basically removing people from trade professions in the mountains um, and moving them into agricultural situations in the lowlands. And that affects uh, one major aspect of the language, uh, which is agricultural production of grapes in, in Derbent. Actually, the image you see here is from a novel called Clusters of Grapes um, that is about how the Soviet period affected people's exchange um, in the, the grape fields, which were collectivized during the Soviet period. Finally, um, starting in the 80s, this is something you are probably familiar with uh, in the movement of Soviet Jewry over time, there um, it, people find chances to leave, to leave the Soviet Union. And despite the suppression of Jewishness, um, there's a movement to Palestine, Israel, there's movement to um, areas near Jewish communities in Brooklyn, Vienna, Berlin, Moscow. And today that's a, a little glimpse of what the Jehudi diaspora looks like. And, and as you can see, it often, means congregation on Zoom and just the exchange of all these different uses of language on Zoom. Okay, 
Well, um, Juri language varieties today obviously have been affected by that huge movement. Um, linguists, uh, Gilles Archer and Fouad Suleimanov, who I really want to thank for um, historical teachings that have helped me put together the preceding information, um, have documented a number of varieties here. So there's the Khaitag um, variety, which you can see in the north and particularly to the west. Uh, there are a number of prominent Juri linguists and historians who use this variety in northern Dagestan and in Derbent. There's a really prominent set of varieties. And then the Khubat variety is also super prominent um, particularly because Hubet today is the only place where Jukurho lived together in a single town that is basically um, entirely uh, inhabited by Jukurho. It's a very special place um, and, and a place that provides a lot of hope for my teachers, for example, uh, Batsyon and Yeva, for the future of the language. Briefly, I want to talk with you about the writing systems um, that have come into play because you're going to see some of them are presented. Um, early on, so prior to 1929, there was a Hebrew-based writing system, um, but the thing is it was actually um, not institutionalized or dictated by the state in the way that subsequent writing systems would be. So um, there are many records of young Juhurko, particularly young Juhuri boys who received rabbinical educations or received religious educations and were able to uh, write in Juhuri as well, or to write in uh, what could be called Judeo-Persian using Hebrew characters. That doesn't mean that everyone was using the same characters to represent the same sounds um, or anything of that nature, but there was some standardization happening as textbooks started to be produced in this uh, alphabet under the Soviet government and so on. However, in 1929, as part of a wave of Latinization, Romanization across Eurasia, not only in the Soviet Union, but in the Soviet Union in particular, you have a switch to a Latinate alphabet. One interesting fact is that the person who developed this alphabet was actually in his early 20s when he did so and had been active in the Komsomol, in Soviet structures, since his early teens. Um, Yakov Agarunov, or Yakhu Agarunov, um, very controversial figure, uh, we'll see him mentioned again. But um, you can see the shift even in the Juhudi press from a predominantly Hebrew-based to a Latinate uh, form of typing, but also there's always some, some uh, leakage, basically. So you can see up here the newspaper Zakhmet Kesh, or the toiler, um, with a gloss of the title of the newspaper in uh, Latinate and in Cyrillic. Um, however, by the time you have this sort of unifying uh, anti-religious shift away from Perso-Arabic alphabets, away from the Hebrew alphabet, um, the newspaper, the communist was written entirely in the Latinate script. Now, one more shift, as you saw earlier, there is uh, use of Cyrillic in Juhudi, and actually um, in the late 30s, two different Cyrillic alphabets succeeded the Latinate alphabet as part of a broader Soviet push against uh, basically Western seeming things, uh, to put it really broadly. Um, there were shifts in many languages, forced shifts into the Cyrillic alphabet. Here on the top row, you see the Cyrillic alphabet that was instituted in Dagestan and at the north. It uses a lot of digraphs. So for example, this um, digraph here represents U, this front rounded vowel, whereas in the Azerbaijani Cyrillic based alphabet, U is given by a special character. And you see that in a number of instances um, another really great example, is this character, the fourth character, you can see this diagram, um, it's actually pronounced a variety of different ways, but I'll use that particular one for now. It's given by one character in the Azerbaijani uh, alphabet. So um, to give you an overall glimpse, this is the kind of range of uh, written practices that someone has to be able to engage with in order to engage with um, the Juri language and writing over time. This is the phrase, Zuhun de Dei. Um, it's, um, it means mother tongue, essentially can be translated as mother tongue, uh, it'd be better to say. And the word zuhun here can be translated as either tongue or language, while dede is used to mean mother. Um, zuhun dede. So you can see how that plays out over the course of um, history from the, before the Soviet Union into the present day. Actually, in the present day, in a state of diaspora, a lot of people use, uh, a lot of the friends I've encountered, colleagues I've encountered, use voice messages to communicate in Juhuri, um, which I think is a fantastically creative way to approach um, the state-imposed uh, and um, state-forced differentiation in, in the way that the language has been written over time. Um, to contextualize 
some of the differences between language varieties. I want to show you the impact of the influences of different languages on Juhuri. Um, and I'll start with the uh, exchange that Juhuri has had with Turkic language over time, particularly what was standardized as Azerbaijani. So in the early 20th century, in the 19th century, um, I have heard uh, people and I've seen sources refer to this language as Turki, just Turkic. Um, but um, what became Azerbaijani ended up um, having a lot of exchange with Juhuri, both in language policy and uh, in vocabulary. So you see at the top of the video here, the word Mughlam, um, that's a word that's coming from Azerbaijani and refers to a style of song. I wanna play this uh, little clip and if you could just kind of observe for yourself what characteristics you notice about the musicality, um, the melody and um, uh, the technique of, of this clip. Um, see if you can note those. So you'll notice that there's improvisatory accompaniment here. There's improvisatory ornamentation. You've got microtones going on. And all of this um, is incorporating also, some Turkic vocabulary, uh, given that Yossi Ben Yochai uh, has a lot of contact with Azerbaijani. Oh, yeah, you heard the Ayn. Um, so uh, that is definitely a phoneme that, that is happening in, in Juhudi, oh, the, the much further uh, backstop to the beginning of some syllables that you hear. Um, so we can think about uh, Juhudi as a language that engages with the Turkic world, but also engages with the Persian world or Persianate world. Scholars use various terms. Um, and a lot of the scholars I know tend to find all of them problematic because they center uh, what is today Iran. Of course, there's nothing inherently more central about Iran than there is about Juhudi. And in this case, we have a folklorist from the 20th century, Naida of Shalumova, who was writing an article in the um, Northern um, variety of Juhudi in the Northern alphabet, comparing a particular folk tale in Juhudi to a section of the Shahnameh, the Persian Book of Kings. And she's finding a lot of parallels between those two. Similarly, the Juhudi language's grammatical structure is very similar to that of many Persian languages, such that I can often, as a Juhudi speaker who has no, you know, no contact with uh, Farsi, for example, I can often parse um, syntax or parts of speech when I hear Persian, even when I'm unfamiliar with the vocabulary, because I'm familiar with Juhudi vocabulary that has contact more with Turkic languages, and as we can see soon with uh, Hebrew and Aramaic. So next I'm going to play a clip, a clip from a uh, Passover Seder that was conducted in, in Juhudi, and there are actually four different Hebrew words that you'll hear coming up in this clip, including the very first word, which I'll give to you, kiddush. Um, and if you uh, have um, the urge, please try for yourself to, to listen for those words, four words in Hebrew, including kiddush. Okay, so if you have access to Hebrew yourself, you may have noticed in addition to the first word kibush, um, uh, the rabbi actually said kiddush sochtenki, so when we do kiddush, just integrating it into a Persianate verbal structure. Um, Hashem, so he noted explicitly that rather than saying the name of God, num and chudo, the name of God, he's going to say Hashem. Um, he used the word baruchah, uh, which has a cognate bracha in, in modern Hebrew today, so referring to a blessing. And also the name of the holiday Pesach or Passover that's most commonly used in Juhuri is Nisonu, named after the month of Nisan. Um, you may have also noticed if you're a speaker of Russian or have some contact with Russian, some um, words that, that are shared with Russian. For example, imitirovat sohta, that's using the word imitirovat to imitate and adding um, an auxiliary verb sohta, which means to do or make. Um, and 
we can see lots of influences like that, particularly through the Soviet Union. So what you see here is the cover of a book by the poet Zoya Semenduyeva. It's called Komune, or The Rainbow. And you can see a lot of Soviet visual motifs here, particularly the wheat um, and also the grapes. We're talking here about collectivized agriculture, right? And um, the titular poem in this collection, Komune, actually rests on a wordplay with the word komun, meaning the commune. Um, so there's uh, a language here circulating in the Soviet world. Um, beyond uh, the Soviet context, Turkic context, Persian context, you also have the integration of Juhudi in a broader fabric of uh, folklore and narrative in the Muslim world that affects how people use the language. Here, you're going to hear um, Baba Vera, Valeria Nakshun's grandmother, um, telling a story. And I want to know if you can catch the name of the protagonist just within the first couple seconds of this clip. So the name of the character is Mol Nasreddin, which you might recognize because uh, Nasreddin Hoja Mola Nasreddin goes under various names, but he's an old man who has a donkey and um, has wisdom and foolishness in equal measure and is widespread in stories from Urdu to Turkish to uh, Balkan languages. So just really um, a prolific character. And there are even Juri versions of him with their own names. So here you see Shimi Derbendi, a character created by Hizgil of Shalumov, actually um, the father of Naida of Shalumov, the folklorist. Um, and this here is the wall of the bands, the same one you saw in the photograph earlier. Um, but here is this character who, you know, people most closely associate with other languages here. He's riding his donkey. Um, one difference is that he's wearing actually a hat that's associated with the Caucasus, a papaka hat. So you see this character doing kind of silly Mola Nasruddin things, giving advice, tricking people, but doing so in specifically Jewish and Soviet and Juhudi ways. Um, and, and this is one way in which the language has created a, its own world. For the next um, section of the presentation, I want to contextualize some of the impacts of these linguistic developments um, and developments in the history of the language by focusing on two particular figures. Um, for the 19th century, I want to talk about Mardachai of Shalom Sibiri. How he got that name is going to be apparent uh, in a second. Let's start with a quote. I'm going to read it first in my uh, quick translation and then in the original. And I want you to think about how these words could possibly come to be uh, coming from a Juhudi poet of the 19th century. He writes in my translation, I fear none of you. The people give me passion for an undying struggle if you send me to Siberia. And in the original, Now, Mardachai of Shalom Sibiri was um, given the name Sibiri because he was uh, incarcerated in the Siberian labor system of the Russian Empire on multiple occasions. Here's a picture of him. Um, it's a photograph, actually, that um, you see scanned from its original form on the left, and then restored um, by Anatoly Senyan, a Russian poet, on the right. Um, Mandakhai of Sholem Sibiri was a very tall person. Um, at first, when I read that he was about seven feet tall, I didn't believe it until I saw this photograph where he's standing next to his wife, Narukuz, who is a major figure in his life and his work, and she is standing on a box of some kind. Um, so we have a strong man who was arrested, um, as the story goes, for defending a Juhudi woman from assault by a Russian imperial officer, and who, according to one of his epitaphs, escaped incarceration 12 times and was recaptured. So he became both a bardic poet and an insurgent hero. Why? Because this is the time period when you have contestation between the Persian Empire and the Russian Empire. And what happens is a series of treaties um, that transfer territory without, you know, the consent of the people living in this on this land from the Persian Empire to the Russian Empire. Um, and within the conflicts that develop, particularly the Caucasian Wars, um, which uh, in which one of the primary historical protagonists is Imam Shamil um, and Avar uh, leader, so for coming from the Avar people. Uh, you have um, violence that drives some people out of the law, basically, into um, an, an outlaw condition that in Chechen has been called uh, that of an abrek. So on the left here, you see someone named Zelam Kha, who was living outside the law in um, as, as a Chechen, um, and that is a kind of persona with which CBD has a lot of resonance. He is living outside the law for until the Soviet period. On the right, you have two figures, Giovanni and Shaza, who are both what you call an... Uh, well, um, called in different languages an ashik or ashuk, 
referring to a bardic singer, someone who has an instrument usually and makes their living traveling and singing songs that they compose typically. Shaza um, is particularly extraordinary because she was the first uh, woman that um, historians know of who took this path. So put um, these roles together and you get Mardukhaya of Shalom Sibiri. So where is Mardukhaya of Shalom Sibiri sent? To Irkutsk. A, an enormous distance to have traveled, an enormous distance to escape from. And one remarkable thing about the way the Jehudi language has functioned over time is that um, as Madhav Shalom Sibiri is composing verses and escaping, he is enabling those verses to circulate orally among his people in both Jehudi and what was later standardized as Azerbaijani over an enormous distance. Um, I'm not particularly sure, and I haven't yet read sources or talked with um, his relatives today about what um, exactly enabled him to do this, to, to have songs circulating in dead bands while he was constantly being taken so far away, but it's a truly remarkable story, I think, um, that was curated and cared for by Juhudi poets later in the century. Despite um, CBD being an anti-Tsarist insurgent, he was actually often censored during the Soviet period. This might be because a lot of poets turned him for religious associations. Um, so one of those poets was Amaldan Kukulu, who actually published in um, illegally, an, an illegal system or Samizdat uh, publication, a number of uh, CBD's poems. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1995, he made his own little independent press using the same equipment and produced this awesome volume um, of Mardukhaev Shalom Sibidi's work. Today, uh, the primary caretaker of his legacy is actually one of his nephews who is an artist living in Palestine, Israel. Um, really amazing work. Often that work involves um, moving from handwritten transcriptions. So the left here, um, you have a transcription by Semyon Yusufov that he did from, like, from his own memory in the 60s. Um, and then, um, my transcription into uh, TypeScript. It's really a process of close engagement um, with the text that's required for Jewish language advocacy today. And meanwhile, I'm going to move on to thinking about the implications of these um, uses of the language and shifts in the language in the 20th century by focusing on one of the best known Jehudi educators in the community, Shushana Pinchasova, who was born Shushana Chanukhaeva. Actually, our uh, knowledge today of um, the usage of the word juhud in the community or juhudi comes from her interrogations by the Soviet state. So in the late 30s, uh, Pinkhasova gets caught up in um, and targeted by the Soviet government in Dagestan, where she lived. And um, Dilshad Ramazanova, the historian, has looked at her NKVD transcripts, where she says the term tat was incorrect. We call ourselves Juhud, and the local communities around us collectively call us Juhud, both terms referring to Jews. Um, and so it's really remarkable how this, this one individual was able to survive um, even that kind of uh, persecution. She started out working with other Jehudi educators, including religious educators like Rabbi Zakwe Chudai Natav, another major figure, um, in uh, an era of national committees, so-called. So in the early 20th century, before Soviet control was established um, in uh, the Caucasus, you had a lot of different groups establishing national committees to run education within their communities. Uh, it became dangerous in the Soviet period to have been associated with these groups, but um, you can see that she was a part of the early organizing of Dagestani teachers. Then by 1927, you have um, our old friend Yahu Agarunov, that young man who was a Soviet firebrand who developed the Latinate alphabet um, based on uh, Azerbaijani activism that was going on at the time. And Shoshana bin Khasava has to contend with this guy who would much rather her ideas and her history and background not be present in the development of a new modern Soviet taught people. Um, but she makes it through this as well and um, actually survives um, into a period when uh, her family is living in the Soviet Union uh, under these conditions. So she's advocating for the Jehudi language the whole time. And I want to thank the historian Irina Mikhailova, who has done amazing work in collecting these images and, and histories, um, which are published on the website for um, Stmegi, a Jehudi media organization. Now, um, why is Pikasova important? So many reasons. One of them is that um, her work helps us think about Juhudi education over time. Now, I wonder if I can um, get this scrolling feature. There we go. Okay, what you see here is an early textbook that was published under the Soviet government um, for second grade 
Jehudi students. It's a reader in a Hebrew script, as you can see. Um, what you see over time from there is a movement away from Jewishness and ultimately away from the Jehudi language towards a Russo-centric Soviet education system. Um, for example, it's an excerpt in the Latinate script from um, a Jehudi textbook. And it um, also is a really cool example of um, regional variation in Jehudi. It's called Duyumun Sal, meaning second year. Um, Duyumun, as you can hear, is a word that has vowel harmony in it. Each of the vowels is a front vowel, and it's actually the same one, U. A lot of Jehudi speakers, especially in the north, would say Duyumun, Duyumun. So they would use a different vowel um, in the middle. They don't have that vowel harmony. And that is part of the exchange that happens with Turkic languages in Juhudi. So um, Turkic languages that have vowel harmony, such as Azerbaijani, when in contact with the Azerbaijani varieties of Juhudi, often um, you see today greater vowel harmony in those varieties. Okay. Now, if we look at 2001, what happens as a consequence of the hard work that people like Pinchasova were doing? Well, um, here, a really prominent translator, writer, um, Asya Izgiyayeva, is um, putting together a taught uh, language textbook. In 2001, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, she's using the Dagestani Cyrillic alphabet, and she's still using a lot of Soviet motifs. Here, you can see the Soviet motif of the friendship of peoples. Um, so the idea that actually, you know, these different nationalities in the Soviet Union were cherished and celebrated and united. Um, as we've talked about, that was complicated. Um, but um, the thing is that she has to do this outside the purview of the Soviet Union, not only because that state no longer exists, but also because in the late Soviet period, Jehudi schools no longer existed. Um, and in fact, Azerbaijani and Russian language education was the only form of education available to Jehudi adults and children. So as Valeria says in that interview uh, that we've talked about, what frustrates me is that my grandmother started her education in a Jehudi speaking school, but then during her lifetime, the schools became Russian speaking. So at first you have state sponsorship of indigenous languages and other languages of the Soviet Union that didn't have much state power. And later, um, starting under Stalin, you have a shift away from that policy and towards Russian language education or just the language of the predominant um, or uh, selected sort of ethnic groups of a particular republic. Um, George, I think, puts it really aptly. He's a friend who interviewed Valeria. He says, ironically enough, the force that brought our culture almost to extinction is also sim simultaneously the one that has preserved it, meaning that the texts and stories that are still circulating today, people still turn to and respect and revere today in Juhuri are often ones that emerged during the Soviet period, often with Soviet state sponsorship, a very complicated and um, violent and hurtful situation, ultimately. So finally, Juhuri today. Um, I think that in thinking about what is most important about the Jehudi language, uh, it's more important to think about context, use, why the language matters to people, um, how they create with it, than to think about exactly what state or status the language might have today. But um, in speaking with linguists of Jehudi, um, I heard some agreement that there are probably 30,000 or 40,000 speakers of the language today, including a wide range of ways of speaking. So that might mean, um, you know, using the language for everyday uh, in an everyday household context, but not reading literature or um, using the language in a job context. It might mean just knowing some words and integrating them into conversations in other languages. Um, but it's it's um, a really um, vibrant community um, that um, we're going to hear a little bit more about how this community uses the language in different domains of life. One of those domains is storytelling. So. Um, my Jewish teachers and colleagues um, are definitely um, really excited about and are extremely skilled in using the Jehudi language to narrate the past and to narrate important lessons um, about the world. Here we have Simon Marodachayev, who lives in um, New York, in Brooklyn, doing some narration uh, with the Endangered Language Alliance. Ja, of ja, 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 
there's a word here that has come up before in, in our presentation today. Um, so maybe you heard that pronounced here. Um, the concept of Zuhundadei or mother tongue is one that um, Juri language advocates turn to very often in, in my personal experience. Um, in fact, one of the most prominent forces for advocacy for the Juri language is a WhatsApp chat um, that has more than 100 members called Zuhundadei mother tongue. Um, and here you see some news coverage on the Stemegi website um, of members of that group um, who are convened together. Um, this media outlet, Snegi, has also just a very complicated uh, positioning, both economic and political, but um, is one uh, very prominent source of funding um, for, for the Juhudi language. Um, it, it, I think, illustrates the kind of complicated positions that a lot of Juhudi language activists find themselves in. Um, so there's always a choice to be made about whether to interface with an organization that has close ties with the Israeli government, the Azerbaijani government, and the Russian government, um, all governments that are invested in ethnic cleansing at the moment. So um, that's one complication of using the Jehudi language today, and people handle it creatively through participation in these broad collectives where they're relying on one another in addition to turning to external funding. Another really important use of the language is um, through dramatic performances. So here you can see um, the ways that kids can get involved in the language as well. This is also a video sponsored by Stemeki. Hello, Shumik. Go in and choose an art to get to her. Mama, you're going to go to her. Mama, you're going to go to her. Mama, So here, what's going on is you have a, um, someone, a, a lovelorn young man coming to a rabbi for advice, and he's being asked, what is your profession? He says, I'm a singer. The rabbi's like, Baruch Hashem, uh, Baruch Hashem, <laughs> and says, sing. So that's my Hebrew coming out from childhood. Um, in any case, um, what you see here as a trend is intergenerational collaboration. Um, this video was not produced entirely by children, although they're the ones making it happen. And that is um, a pretty common phenomenon. So while you see intergenerational language shift, you also see young people um, working with older people in their communities to put together creative um, productions, essentially, um, whether it's drama, poetry, animation. Um, now, in terms of language shift, this is you know, really complicated. It, um, there are a lot of obstacles in the face of younger Jewish activists, because um, if, like, for example, in the case of, um, a young Jehudi person whose family is from Azerbaijan. There's been contact with Russian due to Soviet colonialism. There's been contact with Azerbaijani. Um, there's been probably some contact with Hebrew uh, at some point. There's Jehudi um, as a language of the specific Jehudi community. And then um, if the family moves, for example, to Brooklyn um, or to Detroit or um, to Florida, then the person you know, might grow up speaking English. And when someone in their vicinity, in school, at work, asks where they're from, there could be a temp temptation to say, Russia, the Soviet Union, Azerbaijan. Like there, there's a whole range of responses that people come forward with. And often, Juri becomes not just a heritage language, but a deprioritized heritage language by the surroundings. So like the, the surroundings of an individual might deprioritize a language um, that those surroundings have no knowledge of. So like a, a fellow students in a school might never have heard of Juri, but have heard of Russian. Um, and this chart, is a demonstration of that. It's actually done by Daniel Kaufman and Khabib Borjan, who are inv involved in the Endangered Language Alliance, um, the folks who put together that video with Simon Mardachayev telling the story about the mother. Um, and they noted that among teenagers uh, living in New York who have Azerbaijani ancestry, the typical situation is proficiency in English, just using English on a day-to-day -day basis, and then having contact with Russian. Um, but Juhudi and Azerbaijani may not be um, in the picture in the same way or to the same degree. So how do young people uh, push against the assimilatory forces that are deprioritizing Juhudi in their lives or taking away the time and resources that they would want to, to use to study Juhudi? Here's one example. This is the video I was playing as you all were logging in. Um, it's an animation by Shoshana Yusufova um, that is a lullaby, a traditional Jehudi lullaby that she composed the lyrics for, but sought help with the translation into Jehudi, um, with the uh, melodic part, the instrumentation, and in incorporating traditional design elements herself, she's creating this really multi-generational picture of Jehudi life. 
Um, and since I played that video earlier and we're getting to the 50 minute mark, I'll just leave that for you all to uh, listen to in full. It's a really gorgeous video. Um, and I really admire the work that um, Shoshana Yusufa has done. The final point I'm going to make is that Judy today has um, an extraordinary function of exchange among cultures and languages. And um, I say extraordinary because of the position that many Juhu are put in, um, as opposed to say uh, Yiddish speakers in the United States who can turn to a number of strong institutions, well-funded institutions um, and other, other Yiddish speakers in many cases, Valeria is talking here about how when she learned about her heritage, learning that she wasn't Russian, in fact, that her family is from Dagestan and they're Jewish, um, she turned to Central Asian dance. She turned to Sephardi nonprofits. So she was putting together different communities in finding her own heritage, which um, led her to become a leader in online activism in the Jodi community. Um, the very last video I'm going to play is an interview that I conducted with one of my teachers, Batsiona Bramova. Um, and just real quick, so you can, this is just an audio clip and there are multiple subtitles you can follow. On top, you'll see um, written in um, non-Latinate scripts for the most part, if it, in, in Hebrew script and Cyrillic, you'll see the Hebrew and Russian and Juhudi and Azerbaijani that she's using. Right below that, you'll see um, a transliteration into um, a Latinate that I hope will be easily understandable for English readers. Um, so this isn't you know anything scientific, uh, you know linguistically technical. It's not IPA. It's just you know so that you can read and listen to the sounds and hope they correspond. And then my translation underneath, and you'll see um, different languages capitalized or in brackets or italicized. So you can see how many different languages Batsiona is incorporating into her explanation of the importance of the phrase "zuhundede" or mother tongue. <laughs> Le phrase is le slavo se chitania zunde dae im at margesha at tagede ze ve targishe ze. Tis great I name shalak tagede ta mishpata et a phrase ze slavo se chitania. I targishe is a utsma ha at margesha raksha at mivate ze. Zunde dae de dae de dae. Сколько дедей святая, сколько дедей великая, столько дедей непоколебимая. Перед дедей э, надо только, как, как, как бы, большими глазами дай. Зун дедей столько этот ценится. Почему? Это первый пришел, как я сказала, это инстинктивно пришел so today you see um, how Juhudi language advocates are bringing together English, Hebrew, Russian, Azerbaijani, Juhudi, in many cases also German, Turkish, a whole range of languages in order to um, connect with other communities and push against the histories of colonialism that have made it difficult to turn to the heritage language that's so key to the community and so powerful and essential as Batsion is describing in this clip. Um, I want to thank one more time Batsion Abramova, Jiraltia, Yevashavir Abramova, and Murad Suleimanov, teachers who have really enabled me um, to do the work that I do. And I'm looking forward to um, you having the chance to engage further with these visuals, uh, any references that you'd like to engage with. Um, thank you so much, everybody.